and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the HQuick Patient Safety Network Series on Pressure Injury. Today's session will cover tools for prevention. We have just a few housekeeping items as we get started. All lines are muted, so please use the chat box to ask any questions or share comments. For technical issues, please chat to all panelists. And as we near the end of the webinar, please answer the polling questions that will pop up on the lower right-hand side of your screen. We couldn't host events like these without the help of our partners who assist with recruitment, enrollment, and technical assistance. Our partners have experience with hospital quality improvement, serve as advisors, and can cross state lines to collaborate with hospitals. Thank you to Alabama Hospital Association, Comagine Health, Georgia Hospital Association, KFMC Health Improvement Partners, and CONSA. Today's webinar hosts are Sarah Phillips, Senior Improvement Advisor at Comagine Health, and Tracy Rutland, Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Specialist at Georgia Hospital Association. I will now turn it over to Sarah, who will talk about today's objectives. Good morning, everyone. First, I apologize for not having changed the title on the first page of this presentation. Today, we're actually going to be talking about some of the special considerations for skin injury in COVID-19 patients. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to um, address the fact that we're doing this at what everyone is hoping will be the end of the pandemic phase of COVID. You know, I still think that this information is very pertinent because unfortunately, as our experts are telling us, it looks like COVID is going to be with us. So these are things that going forward, we believe you still can use in your pressure injury program to be able to identify the differences in skin injury with patients with COVID-19 as opposed to those that are pressure injuries. And then at the end, we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up and we're going to state the elements of an effective pressure injury program so that you are reminded of those and can implement those in your facility in order to reduce pressure injuries there where you're working. We're going to talk a little bit about the variables and hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll understand the variables associated with COVID-19 skin injury. And hopefully tomorrow you'll be able to use these elements in an effective pressure injury prevention program. So let's start by talking about the obvious special considerations for COVID-19 patients. You know, this has been all over the news, so none of these are going to be new to you, even if you haven't handled some of these patients in your hospitals. If you have, then they're very familiar to you. These patients very rapidly went into ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome. So you were dealing with severe hypoxia. They're very immobile, more immobile even than your routine very sick ICU patient because they often had to be in the prone position in order to facilitate their respiratory status. Hypotension and hypovolemia were very common with these patients and the skin conditions that we associate with pressure injury were present also. Diaphoresis, dehydration, and I didn't add this, but in some cases, very dry skin also multiple medical devices, even more than you see, again, with the routine ICU patient who's very sick. Now, there are a couple special issues that were specific to COVID-19 that have been identified. And most of this information comes from a webinar that I attended with the National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel where they had several experts who cared for these patients present. One of the things that was very common were purpuric, purple skin, and toe lesions. A lot of them had rashes, similar to what you might see with meningitis. Alcohol areas of erythema, erythema and vesicles or pustules were common in these patients. And the acryl, that's um, associated with the extremities. Urticarial lesions very itchy, maculopapular eruptions, 
and levodo and or necrosis of the skin and that levodo is a bluish net like mottled appearance to the skin. So this is actually a picture of a COVID skin condition. And you'll see here that this looks a little bit different than pressure injury, but it could easily be confused with pressure injury. There are multiple forms and multiple patterns. And these they believe are associated with microvascular occlusion of the vessels in the skin. And it can appear with a livid, lividoid or lace-like pattern most commonly on the extremities. And others can look more like purpura, hemorrhagic areas across the skin. Rarely some of the patients had appearance of purpural, purpura fulminans and frank necrosis or skin infarct. You know, you often see this in septic patients, so it's probably not surprising that they also saw this was COVID-19. So why isn't this pressure injury? They've done studies now, and they biopsied these skin lesions in these patients. And they demonstrated a pattern of tissue damage that was consistent with complement-mediated microvascular injury. In other words, this was something that occurred from the disease process, not from pressure injury. And from that data that's available now, there they noticed a subset of sustained severe COVID-19 that might define a type of catastrophic microvascular injury syndrome that was mediated by the activation of comp complement pathways and associate procoagulant state. So these patients were very prone to bleeding and clotting. So how do you differentiate this as you go forward with these patients? These appear, these is, this is the clinical guidance from the experts who presented in this panel. Usually these appear as purple areas on non-pressure loaded surfaces. So that patient that we showed the picture of, you notice that those pressure injury, those um, skin injuries were on the buttocks. Well, that patient had been prone, so there had not been pressure on that area. These injuries will lack a pressure shear etiology, and they shouldn't be classified as pressure injuries. You know, some of this, when I look at it, I wish we'd had this at the very beginning of the COVID crisis, because I believe we've probably in multiple facilities classified things as pressure injuries that were actually related more to the disease process. And then these skin manifestations, they might also resemble other dermatological conditions, thrombosis, microvascular injury, such as the retiform purpura that you see in sepsis, and the levodo reticularis and cutaneous vasculitis that you see, that bluish net-like modeled type of pattern on the skin. And then these purple areas on pressure loaded, non-pressure loaded, on pressure loaded, sorry, surfaces, they really do require further investigation. So don't just assume it's COVID-19 in that type of patient. Really do the same things that you would normally do with any skin injury and really assess that patient. The deeper soft tissue may also be damaged because of a pressure shear along with these injuries that are associated with the disease process. And then discolored areas on any body surface that's been subjected to pressure loading or shear should be palpated to detect any differences in the tissue consistency and the temperature to rule out any concurrent deep tissue pressure injury. And for this, I would recommend that if you have wound care specialists, that you rely on them for that element because they have the expertise to do that deeper assessment. If not, if you have a wound care physician, I would rely on them to do that deeper assessment. 
So let's talk a little bit about how we can prevent pressure injury in any patient with ARDS. You always are going to do the things that you do with any patient, conduct skin checks on a per shift and daily basis, and when they're off the floor for more than four hours in another department. You're going to use pressure redistribution surfaces and devices to take that pressure off from the bony prominences. And I'd also add here, and we're going to talk about the endotracheal tube down the slide, but, you know, think about all those medical devices and make sure that you're using the foam and the devices that are available to prevent device injury. You're going to use appropriate mattresses or overlays for these patients and really watch that endotracheal tube. Make sure that it's secured and that it's taped into position. And then use a liquid film forming protective dressing applied to the forehead and chin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but some of the links that we've put in chat for you will direct you to some resources for that type of dressing. And then as always, lubricate the eyes and tape them closed. Special things for patients who have to be prone. Make sure you're using that swimmer's position so that you're not getting uneven pressure on the extremities. And check for any uneven pressure redistribution that needs to happen. And again, you'll find some guidelines for that on the links that we've put into the chat for you. If at all possible, you're going to want to try to reposition this patient every two hours. Now, as we know, with many of these COVID patients, that was not possible. And when you're looking at either life or death, sometimes you can't do that. But when possible, it really should be done. Keep your skin clean. Make sure you're conducting those regular skin checks. And make sure, even in this patient, that they have adequate nutrition and hydration. When you reposition them back, make sure that you assess all the pressure points from that prone positioning. And make sure that you document a comprehensive skin assessment at all stages of this process. And even in this patient, when you get them to the point that they're starting to recovery, get them mobilized, get them up and get them moving, and that will help to prevent further injury. So we're going to wrap it up at this point. We're going to just go over the elements of what is a strong, happy program. And I've always kind of loved the name that's associated with healthcare acquired pressure injury programs because you know, if you do it right, it's a very happy outcome. So first, make sure you get support and engagement from your leadership because there will be costs to a good program. Make sure that you invest in education that's designed to make sure all of your staff have the competencies necessary to assess and treat skins, injuries, and put in place those prevention mechanisms to prevent those injuries. Make sure you're using a team approach. It's not just about the nurse. It's about everyone caring for that patient, um, especially make sure that your rehabilitation staff are involved in your process. Do timely ongoing skin assessments using a validated tool, and we talked about the tools that have been validated in the U.S., the most common of those, of course, being Braden. And then implement an evidence-based pressure injury prevention product. You know, there are multiple out there. We've given you several links during this series that you can use to find good pressure injury prevention products. If you do have something that's starting to occur with a patient, early intervention is the key. Make sure you're using evidence-based products wherever pressure areas are noted. And make sure that you're monitoring these out, the skin care in your institution and any pressure injuries that occur 
and reporting on the compliance. And when you do have one, that you're doing a root cause analysis of that event hopefully to prevent it from ever occurring again with another patient. So these are the resources that we have for you. All of them have been placed into the chat for you. And as Tracy mentioned, the recording of this presentation will be available to you. Our key takeaways, skin injury in COVID-19 patients is different in some cases than pressure injury, but you really have to be on top of it and make sure that you're assessing that patient for all the variables and assessing the skin appropriately and intervening as needed. That will help you to have a very effective pressure injury program with your COVID-19 patients and all the others within your facility. And we're hoping that this series has been helpful to you as you go forward and really implement an effective prevention program that will help to reduce pressure injuries within your facility. And I'd like to open the, the chat now if you have questions and also admonish you to review the resource materials that we gave today and develop a plan for implementation of these new processes that you might need with this type of patient, and then go on and revise your reduction goal, your short-term and your long-term goal. And Donna, do we have any questions in the chat? Hi, Sarah, we do not have any questions in the chat at this time, thank you. We did want to mention that there is an upcoming pressure injury presentation that's going to be one of the LAN events on April 26th, and you can see the registration link there, but you will also be receiving that within your emails. And that's it. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for collaborating with us and working with us on improving pressure injuries. Have a great afternoon.